Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is uh, uh, the 1960s Part 2, uh, Civil Rights in Vietnam. I will talk about in uh, separate presentations. So where this um, presentation picks up is after the Kennedy administration, after the Bay of Pigs and the Cuba Missile Crisis, after the assassination of LBJ. <clears throat> and Civil Rights in Vietnam will be in a d different uh, presentation. So what we're talking about here is an era of protest and Watergate. And Watergate really represents, this is in 1972, but Watergate really represents the exclamation point at the very end of the 1960s. So let's begin then with an era of protest, and that is Kent State in, uh, in Ohio. The setting of this is Kent State, in, uh, which is a university, a major university in Ohio. It's, uh, as you can see on the, on the slide there, May 4th, 1970. Now, the background information on this terrible, tragic event goes like this. Uh, the Vietnam War was uh, wildly unpopular in the United States. Nobody wanted anything to do with it anymore. It had gone on for years and years and years. And, uh, you know, everybody pretty much knew that it was winding down. Well, while the Vietnam War was going on, there had been a program that the military had uh, instituted that said, listen, if you went to college, you got a university deferral. Because you were in university, you were in college, and so you got a deferral, you didn't have to go to the draft board. Well, the dynamic that emerges then is that a lot of students went to college, uh, went to university that would never have ordinarily gone to college or university. That's fine. They were doing that to get a, uh, a deferral so they didn't get drafted in the military. The second thing, and this is sort of a narrative that's going on, it's really hard to put your finger on this, at this even at this uh, removal, at this uh, like kind of date and time, um, the feeling was that a lot of the university professors were also very much against the war, and they didn't see why uh, anybody should go over there and fight and die for uh, really what was a losing cause. So the professors were saying, yeah, come on, to the, sign into my class, and whether you show up or not, that's fine. Uh, I'm going to make sure you get a, a good grade just to keep you in college, in university as a student in good standing, so you don't have to go off and fight this evil war, this terrible Vietnam conflict. Well, <clears throat> so many students were like not showing up to class, or uh, as you can imagine, marijuana was a big deal back in those, in those days. And so they were like staying at home, doing whatever they're doing, uh, going to the dorm, and they are getting stoned, and they're not like doing any of their studies. Now... That's a terrible statement to make. Many, many, many students went to Kent State and they did a great job and they studied really, really hard and they got good grades and they did what they're supposed to do. But the perception was that, you know, people were using this as a way to get over on going to serve their country. Well, this, is, this influenced the then governor of the state of Ohio and the president of the University of Kent State. And both of them were a couple of World War II guys and they didn't like this idea of these students getting a deferral, but then not going to class, not getting, you know, just having good grades handed to them. So there was a change in the rules. And the rules said that, listen, uh, college professors, now you have to take roll every day, and that's going to be checked on. And if a student gets below a certain GPA, they're going to go, their names are going to be handed over the draft board anyway, and so they have to go. Well, this meant that students who would be against the war and were really, uh, uh, you know, protesting against the war, um, they were going to have to go get drafted anyway, that their college deferral was going to be um, basically revoked. And um, again, the perception is that a bunch of students wanted to, like, you know, be students, but not go to class, not to do any work, and still get a good grade. So when the rules came down and they were changed, there was this protest. And the students occupied the student union was that building in the background. And um, again, the story goes, the narrative goes that it was being ransacked. All the food was being eaten up. All the students were like in there, like taking everything out of it. And, you know, it was just they were just being, you know, kind of rowdy. And as you can see, they'd all, you know, gathered up up there to protest. And they didn't want, you know, they didn't want this rule change. Well, so they're resisting the draft and they're protesting the war. So the last step down there is you have a, an overreaction by the university and by the governor of Ohio. And they called out the troops. Now, um, the thing is that <clears throat> when we take a look at the photograph on the upper left, 
you can see there's a whole bunch of television cameras there as well. If you look especially over on the far left edge of that, uh, those are all television guys. They've got the cameras there. They've got the sound men there. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of guys there. The rest of those guys are National Guardsmen. And either they've been in the National Guard and gone to Vietnam, or, you know, they were, you know, but they were, they'd gone through basic training. They were, uh, they were military men. You know, they're Army soldiers. And so uh, the governor of Ohio called out the, the National Guard. I know it's a little bit hard to make out, but they all have, like, fixed bayonets on their rifles. And that happens a lot when you're doing riot control. The difference here is if you look carefully, when you do riot control and you have bayonets, they make you put the scabbard on. So from a distance, you can't tell that, and it's very, very intimidating. But here, they have the scabbards off. That means that they have fixed bayonets. Also, evidently, it turned out that they were armed. They had, they had bullets with them. And that's usually, like, really much, very much frowned upon. Uh, that you don't you don't do that unless there's uh, clear evidence of uh, you know, genuine violence. Well, uh, as you can see, the soldiers are going in. They're clearing off the students. They're throwing in a bunch of smoke grenades and uh, tear gas. And um, the part of this really um, tragic here is that we'll never know who fired the first shot, whether it was some one of the students, which is what everybody said, or one of the National Guardsmen who just got a little trigger happy and he pulled the trigger. But the result is the same. Uh, the shooting started, and uh, four students were killed, and their uh, pictures are up there on the upper right. Uh, William Schroeder, Allison Krauss, uh, Jeffrey Miller, and Sandra Lee Schauer. And uh, they were, tragically, they were killed. Um, in the lower right, uh, this is the icon photograph of um, this protest. And uh, there's really kind of a lot going on here. At first glance, which is what makes it the icon, that young lady is like, you know, crying and screaming her head off that her, presumably her dead friend is, uh, has been shot. Well, certainly her dead friend has been shot. Uh, my feeling is that that is uh, actually Jeffrey Miller there. Um, and uh, it's really terribly tragic. I want to make sure you guys understand what you're seeing here. Uh, certainly he's lying face down, but if you look... Uh, there's a big giant pool of blood going from him over to the gutter. And so whoever it is, he got shot in the pump. He got got. I mean, he got shot hard right in the chest somewhere. And he has bled out. And so clearly this young lady is like, you know, in, in clear and obvious distress. And that part's true. What's not true, however, is um, she turns out it was a 14-year-old drifter. She was a nobody. She was not in the college or anything else. Now, to be clear, the, the, the stress that she's in is, is clearly, obviously, is real. But the photograph is not faked at all. It happened to be a snap, and it, it turned out to be an icon of the, um, of the situation here of Kent State. But um, there is that element of it. Uh, she had a young lady in the middle. I, I have no idea what her name is. She had no, no business being there. She was the wrong place at the wrong time. But um, overall, the uh, effect of this in the nation is that no one wants to send their child off to college in order to be shot by the Army. And so uh, they, they understand these uh, young people were like protesting against the war, that they didn't like what was going on, that they did not want to be drafted, and they had a right to protest. Now, the way they went about it, maybe that was questionable, but nobody, nobody, this is the feeling in the nation, nobody deserved to be shot. And so this whole thing in Kent State was very, very, a very shocking state of affairs. The entire nation was like um, uh, really, um, I don't know, really just uh, overwhelmed by the situation here. So this is just indicative of how serious the protest against the Vietnam War was becoming. Okay, so with that in mind, let's move on and start talking about uh, the Richard Nixon's administration and the situation in Watergate. So Richard Nixon, now our, our big idea here, our thesis statement is here that when Nixon came into office and then got reelected, we really did like him. We liked Nixon. We liked him a lot. I'll have a, an electoral college map up in the 1972 election in a minute, but we liked Nixon a lot. But then we got to where we did not like him, and he got impeached, and he was going to be removed, but he resigned instead. So let's take a look at, you know, kind of an overall 
Let's find out what's going on with Watergate, why we don't like Nixon. But then let's go ahead and rehabilitate Nixon and find out why we did like him. You know, Nixon is one of these uh, very controversial presidents. But let's go over this and, and see what we can make out. So Richard Nixon, Richard Milhouse Nixon, he's from California. Uh, a lot of people don't know uh, his spirituality. He was actually a Quaker. He's the only Quaker president that we've ever had. Uh, he's from California. He'd, he'd been in World War II. He'd done okay. Uh, he'd been an analyst in the Navy. And he'd done all right. Uh, in the late 1950s, he's going to be the vice president for Eisenhower. And Eisenhower and everybody else was convinced that uh, Nixon would win election in the 1960 election. But as we all know, it turned out to be Kennedy. And Kennedy just looked a whole lot better. I've already talked about that. He presented himself better on television. And so he beat Richard Nixon. Well, Nixon rocks along, and he still uh, stays involved in politics, and Republican Party politics for a while. And uh, LBJ comes in. He gets elected again, reelected again. And so now it's uh, Nixon in uh, 1969. He gets reelected. He, he gets elected for the first time. In other words, in 68, um, LBJ had revealed that he's not going to run for re-election. I've already talked about that, but just to uh, reiterate this, uh, the Vietnam War just destroyed Lyndon Johnson. Uh, none of it went the way he wanted it to go. His domestic policy was completely smashed, and so he was just—he was at the end of—he was at the end of the line. And so he announced that he was not going to run for president. Well, that gave an opening to Richard Nixon, and he took it, and he was elected. Now he runs on a policy of law and order, and this really did appeal to the middle class. Uh, the protests of the Vietnam War were getting out of hand. Uh, people were taking to the streets. Um, there was all this uh, this evil rock and roll music was starting to like really transform the generation, and so the middle class really they you know they didn't like the war, but they didn't like the protests either, and they wanted to get rid of that. They they didn't like that. That was very distasteful to most Americans. So Nixon runs on a uh, a policy of law and order. He'll also talk about reconciliation. You know, let's try and work out the problems between the left and the right, uh, the people that are against the war and the people that are kind of, you know, the silent majority is what he called them, the people that are actually for the war. And so he wanted to, like, you know, try and make friends with everybody. And these are very noble goals, and people like actually liked his ideas. So uh, later on, we will talk about relations with China and detente with the USSR. But the first thing we need to get through is Watergate, which is involved with the 1972 election. So let's move on to Watergate. Now, Watergate, the context of this is the 1972 election. Again, the idea here is we're going to, like, basically tear Nixon down, and then we're going to build him up again. Now, as an event, Watergate is extremely complex. I'm going to try and simplify it here so you guys have just a brief overview. That's what we do in a survey course. I just want you guys to have a brief overview. So here we go. The context of the 1972 election. <clears throat> Nixon had been elected in 68. It had been kind of a mixed bag. But he's going to get elected in 1972 on a landslide. Well, part of that has to do with Watergate. And we'll get into that in a moment. But the problem that, that plagued Nixon was... There was a whole series of leaks, especially the Pentagon Papers. Now, this drove Nixon crazy. There was leak after leak after leak after leak after leak. And this is a guy named Daniel Ellsberg. He's, like, listed on down below. Daniel Ellsberg had worked in the Pentagon. And he kept on, he kept on getting papers from the Pentagon, taking them home, getting them copied, which was, you know, in 1972, that was a big deal. Copy machines were, like, really kind of rare to have. And then taking that information and feeding it to the New York Times. And the New York Times would take a look at them, take a look at the source, and then publish them. And they're collectively referred to as the Pentagon Papers. Well, this was a leak and it was driving Nixon crazy. He did not like leaks. He didn't like it. Well, if you have a leak, you call a plumber. So Nixon and his Confederates, his allies... They put together a little team. Now, this is not, in other words, Nixon knew about it, as, as becomes clear later on. But he didn't know exactly what they were doing. So lower-level 
uh, Republican operatives put together a team, five men. They're called the plumbers. If you have a leak, you call a plumber. Now, they break into and burglarize the DNC headquarters in the Watergate Hotel complex. There's an election going on, 1972. It's an election year. And so they broke in. Because Nixon and his allies, his, his cohorts, they were convinced that the Democrats knew all about it. That was untrue. But the Republican leadership was convinced that the Democrats knew all about the leaks, that they were running it. That was a secret program on their part. So to find out about this, they send the plumbers in to break into the hotel complex and find out what the Democrats know, which, as it turns out, was nothing. Well, they also, along the way, discovered that Daniel Ellsberg is probably the source of the leak. So they broke into um, his doctor. He was having psychiatric help for all the stress that he was under, and they broke into the psychiatrist's office. Well, this turned out to be like really, um, I don't know, an event within itself. In other words, if they'd broken into the psychiatrist's office and just taken Daniel Ellsberg's records, somebody, you know, that would that would reveal something. That something would be going on. So when they went into uh, the psychiatrist's office, they ripped the place apart, tore it all up, and took a whole bunch of different records, which they promptly basically destroyed. But then they kept Daniel Ellsberg's. So this is like really, really, um, you know, these guys were acting. These were really bad actors. Well, while they're in the hotel, Watergate Hotel complex at the DNC headquarters, they install all these wiretap devices, listening devices, recording machines, microphones. They're all over the place. They're also photographing all these documents. It's just, you know, just this crazy CIA cloak and dagger business. Well... Again, technology was not then as it is now. So they didn't have batteries that would like, like last for a long, long time. So sure enough, they kept having to go back and replace the batteries in the recording devices, adjust the microphones, uh, take photographs of other uh, papers and get them all, you know, they, they had to go back on a return visit and find out what else was going on. Well, when they did, one of them had put a tape, a piece of tape over the door latch and that meant that the door was kind of open just a little bit and I tell you plainly Hollywood could not write this stuff uh, a security guard happened to be walking by on a routine patrol and saw a bunch of like crazy lights going on under the door and then he saw the door open just a little bit so the security guard opened up the door and asked the guys hey uh, has something gone wrong with the lights is there something I can help you guys with is there anything around wrong, you know, that we can help you with? And these guys, you know, the burglars, these plumber guys were like, no, we're okay. Everything's fine. Well, the security guard went straight down and called the cops. And um, <clears throat> some uh, Washington, D.C. cops came in and made the arrest. Now, it happened to be some guys that were coming in off of a stakeout sort of thing. And uh, they were kind of in plain clothes. But they got the call and said, listen, you're right next to Watergate. Go in there and find out what the heck is going on. So the Washington police went in there and made this arrest. And here were these guys with all these cameras and listening devices and, you know, cat suits and all this other crazy stuff. And they made the arrest. It was clearly, clearly a and e breaking and entering. Well, a few days later, they are arraigned. That means they're brought before a judge and, you know, they had to plead guilty or not guilty or what's going to happen to them. They had to identify themselves. And uh, the judge would, you know, they were standing in front of the judge, as you can imagine. And they said, the judge said, well, you know, identify yourself and, you know, tell me whether or not you understand the, 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 the seriousness of the crime. And they all identified themselves. Well, they'd say, you know, here's my name. Well, where do you work? Uh, well, blah, 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 blah. And the judge would say, excuse me, where do you work? Speak up so I can hear you. And they would say, well, I actually work for the White House. And the other guy said, yeah, I work for the CIA. And the other guy said, yeah, I'm a subcontractor for the CIA. And another guy said, yeah, I work for. And so they had they had been arrested with water with I'm sorry, with White House and CIA identification cards on them. When they were when they were arrested, they had 
White House and CIA identification papers on them. Now, for reasons which we'll get into in a minute, uh, a reporter happened to be in the courtroom when all that happened and heard all this, and it was like a bomb going off. He's like, what the heck is going on here? What are a bunch of White House and CIA guys doing, doing a B&E on the DNC headquarters in Watergate. In other words, if they're working for the White House, they're working for Richard Nixon one way or another, and they have to be Republicans. So what are they doing in the DNC, the Democratic National Committee headquarters? So uh, the media investigation begins. That's what I have at the bottom. Well, let's go to the next slide. And uh, I have to say, ladies and gentlemen, this is one of my favorite slides that I've ever built. I build my own slides, and this is one of my favorites. So this is them. That is their mugshots on the day that they got arrested. That is the plumbers. This, these guys along the bottom, they're the plumbers. Uh, James McCord, Gonzalez, Sturgis, Martinez, and Bob Baker. So McCord and Baker, they were both White House men. Gonzalez, Sturgis, and Martinez, all of those guys were Bay of Pigs. They were CIA. And so these guys had, and they all had CIA and White House identification papers on them. Uh, in the upper right, you can see an exhibit photograph. Uh, that's the Watergate Hotel complex, which is still there. Uh, that's still an active hotel. You can rent rooms in there for, you know, as long as you need. And the, uh, the DNC had rented a lot of space in there. Uh, if you really have sharp eyes, you can see in the background... Uh, the uh, Capitol building and the White House is just it's not that far away that white building uh, right there on the uh, on the front of the Potomac that's actually uh, the National Archives so um, you know the, the Watergate Hotel complex is right in the middle of downtown Washington very accessible to everything you need to see and do in Washington DC in the uh, upper right those are the actual exhibits those are the microphones that they would put into the hotel room. And you can see that they are disguised as chapsticks. Now, they don't do this anymore, but hotel rooms, even when I was a little kid, uh, hotel rooms would have a bunch of courtesy chapsticks all over the place. They'd have, you know, courtesy writing pens and pencils and all this other stuff. And so they um, made these microphones out to be chapsticks that no one would notice, nobody would pay attention to, and then just put them in the desk drawers. Well, as you can see, they're hooked into, you know, that little connector there. Those are hooked into uh, an actual tape recorder. And so the tape recorder, the microphones, all that stuff would need adjustment periodically. So that's what the guys are doing. That's what uh, McCord, Gonzalez, Sturgis, and Martinez, and Baker are doing. They're in there taking photographs, evaluating the paperwork, you know, getting, getting their little espionage um, activity tuned up. Now, in the middle of the top, you can see that this becomes uh, an absolute media event. There's this huge investigation. Uh, you can see all the, you know, the Time Magazine there. Uh, Earlyman and Haldeman and McCord and Baker and uh, um, all the big shots. And then there is uh, Nixon right there in the middle. And each one is pointing to the other one. He's the one that did it. It wasn't me. It was this other guy. Um... So we know that. In other words, that's kind of a takeoff on a cartoon that we've seen before, all the way back with uh, um, all the way back in Reconstruction. We saw that with Boss Tweed, uh, that Thomas Nash cartoon. So you see that cartoon like showing up everywhere. I mentioned that before. Well, with the arrest in mind, let's go on and take a look at what happens next. Now, the burglars are associated with the CIA and White House. They are caught. And then two reporters, I'll have another slide on them in just a minute, uh, Woodward and Bernstein. They work for the Washington Post. Now, they're kind of guided by a contact they have. And uh, the contact's name, believe it or not, I'm telling you right now, Hollywood can't write this stuff, was uh, nicknamed Deep Throat. Now, only recently has his identity actually come to light. For this whole time, his identity been kept a secret. Um, the individual kept it a secret and uh, the reporters kept it a secret and they absolutely kept that secret for years and years and years. 
Well, then Mark felt uh, just a few years ago, uh, he got cancer and he was going to die. And so he, you know, he stood up on the, you know, he, he contacted a bunch of people, including uh, Woodward. That was his main contact. I said, listen, I'm going to out myself. I'm going to like reveal that it was me. And you, Woodward, you got to back me up. You got to tell everybody, yeah, that was him. And so Mark Felt was the assistant director of the FBI. Now, again, until very recently, we didn't know that. So I updated my, I had to update my own slide. So Mark Felt, the assistant director of the FBI, FBI, who was part of the FBI investigation of the plumbers, was taking that information and secretly giving it to Woodward and Bernstein. So Woodward and Bernstein begin to report what they know. They get a few leads. They run the leads down. Uh, they keep on reporting and stay after it and stay after it and stay after it. So immediately, the White House cover-up begins. Now, strong note on that part. The cover-up begins. The crime was bad enough, the B&E. And if Nixon had come clean immediately and thrown a bunch of people under the bus, uh, McCord and Baker and a whole bunch of other people that were involved in the actual B&E, the breaking and entering, then it would have all gone away. What got Nixon later on was the cover-up. I want to be clear on this. Nixon had no idea about the breaking and entering. He had no idea about the wiretaps. But once the arrest was done, and then the investigation begins and becomes more public through Woodward and Bernstein who are working for the Washington Post, then Nixon says, okay, we're going to cover this up. And it's the cover-up that got him. That's where the problem was. Nixon found out about all this and then didn't say anything to anybody. He just started covering everything up. So, <clears throat> the dirty tricks, conspiracy, secret tape recordings, special investigations complicate the issue. Now, uh, dirty tricks. Uh, there had been, during the 1972 election, there had been a GOP operative, a Republican operated, operative named Daniel Segretti. You don't have to know him, but you have to know that he was like playing all sorts of dirty tricks on the Democrats. And so... This like started knocking um, viable candidates out of the Democratic side. They get a bunch of dirty tricks played on them, and then they wouldn't be good candidates anymore, so they would quit. And that left Hubert Humphrey, who could not win. He was this little bitty guy. He had this slick back hair. Uh, he had this high squeaky voice, and he wasn't going to win. Well, that's who Nixon wanted to run against. Nixon didn't want to run against a tough opponent. He wanted to run against an easy opponent. So Donald Segretti, who had a lot of operatives, started you know, taking money, hiring these guys. Roger Ailes was one of them. He's going to later on be the president of Fox News, which should indicate something to you. And he's going to start you know, tripping up the really good Democratic candidates. And they're going to fall by the wayside one by one because of these dirty tricks. Uh, an example of one of them, uh, one of the uh, Donald Segretti's operatives got a hold of the stationery of one of the candidates. And then they wrote a telephone number on that stationery and then gave it to a reporter. Well, if you're a reporter, the first thing you do is call the number. And it turned out that it was a local prostitute. Well, then they confront the candidate with this idea, hey, here's your stationery with a number on it, and it's a number of a local prostitute. Why do you have the telephone number of a local prostitute on your personal stationery? What, what's going on here? Can you explain this? Uh, they would uh, find out where they were, the Democrats were going to hold uh, an event. They would find out who was contracted to like bring in the, the food and the, the decorations and all that. And when the Democrats would, like, make all the arrangements for the meeting, the big rally, Donald Segretti and his guys would come along behind, contact all the people that were, like, uh, supposed to be setting it all up, and say it's been canceled. So when the candidate and all of his entourage showed up, there's, like, nobody at the rally. The lights are out. The buildings are all locked up. Everything's all, you know, there's no balloons. There's no Kool-Aid. There's nothing there for anybody. And... They'll all say, yeah, well, we heard it got canceled, so we didn't set anything up. Well, this sort of like, this is like really embarrassing for any candidate. It makes them look incompetent. So that's what Donald Segretti and his guys were doing. 
and there was conspiracy, there was secret tape recordings. <clears throat> One thing goes uh, on after another, after another, after another. So in 1974, finally, the Senate investigation begins. Now, I want to be clear on this. The election was in 72, and Nixon is in. And all through 1973, there's all these different, you know, uh, um, newspaper reporting about all these dirty tricks and, uh, in, in the, in the break-in itself. So finally in 1974, the Senate begins to investigate. It took them forever and ever and ever to actually try and do what you and I would think of as the right thing. Fine. Well, while all this was going on, uh, one of the, uh, the, the Senate had these guys up there and were raking them over the coals and were putting them on the spot. And one of the guys, um, Howard Dean, got up there. Now, Howard Dean was a lawyer. Uh, he was uh, very dedicated to uh, uh, the law as a lawyer. Uh, and he was clean. He was clean cut. But he knew all of this stuff. And so uh, he had these great big giant glasses on, and he was in the hot seat, and they were raking him over the coals. And um, one of the senators, Sam Nunn, I think, said, okay, well, what about this, and what about that, and what about the other? And Dean took a long, deep breath, and I think he actually took his glasses off and polished his glasses, put his glasses back on, and you could see him making a decision. And he looked right into the microphone, looked right at Sam Nunn and Fred Thompson and some of these other guys that were up there on the Senate side and said, well, I'll have to check the tape. Well, the next question out of everybody's mouth is, what tape? What tape are you talking about? And so then it was revealed by, you know, one guy that had a crisis of conscience that every conversation in the White House was being taped. Nixon was doing that. Every conversation was being taped. And there's an actual, as an exhibit, that's the tape recorder that you see uh, on the middle right of, this, of the shot there, of the uh, slide. And so uh, Nixon had had his secretary set up this tape recorder. And so every day she would like change the tapes and make sure the batteries are up. And, you know, press the button and have the thing turned on. So every conversation that went on in the White House is taped. And all that stuff is still out there. So the existence of the tapes is divulged. Well, immediately that becomes part of the investigation. And a special investigator, Archibald Cox, is going to be put on the case. And everybody agreed with him as a special investigator. Well, the first thing Archibald Cox said was, I need to see the tapes. You've got to give me the tapes. <clears throat> so Nixon then fires him, and nobody wanted to do that. So Nixon not only he wanted to fire Archibald Cox, but Archibald Cox's bosses did not want that. So Nixon went right down the line. He said, if you're going to fire, you're going to fire Archibald Cox. And they said, no, you're fired. Well, are you? Now you're in charge. Are you going to fire Archibald Cox? And they say, no, and then you're fired. Are you going to fire Archibald Cox? And they'd say, no, then you're fired. And then he finally got somebody in there and said, yeah, I'll fire Archibald Cox. And so that's what happened. There's a guy named Bork. He was going to be the new attorney general. And Bork finally said, yeah, okay, I'll fire Archibald Cox. And that's what happened. Well, then it became clear that Nixon was in on it. He was trying to protect himself, and he was willing to do anything to protect himself. In other words, if he had nothing to hide, then give up the tapes. But he did. He knew he was guilty. So there's a lawsuit, U.S. versus Nixon. Now, this is the Congress of the United States of America versus Richard Milhouse Nixon, the President of the United States. And the Supreme Court made the correct decision here. The Supreme Court said a crime has taken place. And then that crime has been covered up, and that is itself a crime. And there's clearly a conspiracy to obstruct justice, and that is a crime. So a crime has taken place, and there's been multiple crimes associated with that. And so you have evidence of that. You have to give up that evidence. You must give up that evidence. You cannot hide that evidence. Nixon kept saying, this is presidential privilege. These are conversations that took place in the White House, and they're under presidential privilege. And the Supreme Court said, nobody's above the law. You have to give up those tapes. You've got to give them up. So Nixon said, okay, I'll give up the tapes. And they kept saying, 
is this all the tapes? Is this all the tapes? Is this all the tapes? And next he kept saying, yeah, this is all the tapes. That's all the tapes. That's all the tapes. The problem was, of course, that the tapes were numbered. And some of the numbered tapes were missing. So then there was another lawsuit. And they said, you got to give up the other tapes. And he did. Finally, he was compelled to give up the other tapes. Then it turned out that there was a blank space on one of the tapes the last like 15 or 20 minutes. Well, so they went back to Nixon and said, what happened during this? What, what happened here? You were taping along, taping along, taping along, and then all of a sudden it's erased. What happened? Oh, and this is so horrible. Nixon convinced his secretary to claim that she accidentally bumped the button with her knee. And then... 15 or 20 minutes later, she realized that the little red light was not on, and so she went over and, you know, pushed the button and got it to recording again. And that's how we did it. That's how that's how those 13, 14, 15 minutes got missing. Well, then they asked her, well, where is the tape machine from where your desk is? She's like, oh, it's across the room. And they said, well, how did you bump it with your knee? And she said, well, ma 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 so it became clear that Nixon was trying to, like, make his secretary take a bullet for him. It's horrible. So the tapes showed conclusively that the White House, that is to say Richard Nixon, was involved. <clears throat> uh, there's a cartoon on the uh, upper right. I'm sorry, the upper left. Uh, that's by a very famous cartoonist named Shineman. And Shineman, long before all this broke, he wrote that cartoon. And here's all these footprints leading up there to the White House. And it says, wow, all these things are going to the same place. And so Shineman knew, or he didn't know, but he had, you know, um, uh, 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 analyzed the situation. And he knew that the White House was involved. So that's a very famous cartoon. And so there's the Watergate scandal. All these other images here are of the newspapers screaming out loud that Richard Nixon is never going to resign. He won't resign. Well, then three articles of impeachment are passed by Congress. Now, some of the con congressional leadership is going to go talk to Nixon. The Speaker of the House went and talked to Nixon. And he said, listen, if you get impeached, we will remove you. We're going to remove you. And these guys were all Republicans. Even the Republican side was against him. You were going to get removed. So Nixon, who had been saying, I will never resign, I'll never resign, I'll never resign, I'll never resign. Finally, he resigned. August 8th, 1974. So let's move on to the next couple of slides and find out what's, uh, you know, just a little bit more evidence on this. Uh, just kind of flesh it out a little bit. So again, here are, you know, when I was, even when I was a young person, uh, this was this went on this this investigation went on it was on all three channels ABC CBS and NBC all day during the day that's all they had on there they'd like get rid of all the daytime drama they'd get rid of all the soap operas and they would all have this on there so while TV is going crazy I want to draw your attention to the fact that media uh, print media especially uh, the newspapers that was still a really really big deal back in those days. People didn't really trust uh, the news organizations uh, in the major news stations, uh, ABC, CBS, and NBC. That still wasn't really trustworthy. Furthermore, uh, the news agencies, they didn't do a whole lot of special reporting, and so you only had the 30 minutes in the middle of the afternoon from 5.30 to 6. That's all the news that you had. So if you really wanted to find out what was going on, you used print media. And you see, you know, there's the federal grand jury indicts all these aides. Nixon denies everything. Nixon discharges uh, Archibald Cox, uh, gets rid of all this stuff. Um, all these guys are up there. They're saying, you know, uh, you know, it's perfectly legal to have those bugs and all this and the other. They're just lying and lying and lying to cover for the president. Uh, there's Woodward and Bernstein. That's them when they were uh, uh, kind of in the middle of the slide there. That's them when they were young and they, you know, they had kind of the fire in their eyes. Uh, but they're still pretty much, um, you see them on television from time to time, and they're still very much together. Uh, in other words, Woodward and Bernstein, they don't do a whole lot uh, apart, and they're still very highly respected investigative journalists. So this whole thing was just, uh, 
It was the craziest thing ever. But Nixon got caught, and he was guilty, and they had him. And so uh, whether you like it or not or you believe it or not, you got to strike one up for American print journalists. That's that's who did it. Woodward, Woodward and Bernstein, along with a little bit of help from the FBI, they did it. Uh, we had a president who was acting in a criminal fashion, and um, at the end of the day, he got got. All right, so what I want you guys to really get out of, of Watergate, this is genuinely, this is the exclamation point at the end of a decade of turmoil. The 1960s is a decade of turmoil. We have the 68 election that put Nixon in, and then the 72 election, I understand this in the 1970s, but that's a continuation of Nixon. It's a continuation of all the problems that were going on in the nation. And then, to cap it all off, we had Watergate. Strong note here. After Watergate, many Americans no longer trust the government of the United States of America. That is the big deal. In other words, if you look back at Eisenhower or Truman, we trusted them implicitly. You know, those guys had kept secrets when they needed to, but we trusted them completely. They were our presidents and we trusted them. We trusted JFK. We trusted him. We like tried to get along with LBJ, and we trusted him. But after Nixon, after everything that's revealed, we no longer trust the government of the United States. Now we, you know, that's been a problem in American politics since going all the way back to Washington. But here, we don't trust them. Something's up. They're always up to something. Yes. So that's what I want you guys to get out of Watergate. Well, with that in mind, uh, let's continue on and um, take a look at what's going on in the rest of the Nixon administration. In other words, I've torn him down. Let's build him back up again. So what you're looking at here is the Electoral College map from the 1972 election. And um, I'd say there was something going on here that's uh, really kind of uh, striking. Nixon won every state and every electoral college vote except for two, Massachusetts, and that's where Hubert Humphrey was from, and D.C. And Washington, D.C., their electoral college votes don't really count for a whole lot. I think they only have two electoral college votes in all of D.C. But they really knew who Nixon was. They were kind of used to him, and they knew not to vote for that guy. But the entire rest of the country voted absolutely for Richard Nixon. Now there are some among you who will say, well behold, I thought the blue, that meant the Democrats and the red meant Republicans. Uh, that's not the way it's always been. Uh, blue and red are arbitrary colors associated with the parties. As it turns out, it's really CNN who did that. So this slide shows, you know, that the blue in this case are the Republicans. The red in this case happens to be the Democrats. So don't get confused. Richard Milhouse Nixon was a Republican. So evidently, ladies and gentlemen, we loved our Richard Milhouse Nixon. We loved him. Everybody voted for this guy. Part of this was he was running against a really bad candidate, and that was Hubert Humphrey. He had this squeaky voice. He was this little bitty guy. Um, and just, you know, he just, he didn't come across on television very well. And so... Nixon, again, I pointed this out, this is part of the Watergate uh, agenda, was to have all these dirty tricks against Hubert Humphrey and Eugene McCarthy and uh, some of the other uh, really powerful Democratic candidates until the really strong Democratic candidates were out. And Nixon only had to face a really, really weak Democratic candidate, and that, you know, the, we won. Well... Let's take a look at some of the things that made Richard Milhouse Nixon win the 1972 election. Now, one of them is uh, his trip to China, which was in 1972, early on before the election. In other words, he did this during the year. The election is all the way in November. So he takes a trip to China. Now, the deal is on this, and Nixon had said this publicly and repeatedly. The economy was beginning to slip. We needed new markets. Strong note here. Please understand the context of this. 
Europe had been rebuilt after World War II. The Marshall Plan was wildly successful. And so all these European markets were beginning to dry up since they all had domestic production and they didn't need American goods anymore. So we had that going for us. Then all of the recovery after World War II domestically in America, that had all been done. The highways were like getting done. Uh, we talked about that Eisenhower's highway program. That was like starting to wrap up. Everybody that wanted a car had a car. So the economy was beginning to flatten out and beginning to level out. The rest of the world, that's Africa, uh, Central and South America, you know, their markets were already flooded with American goods. So Nixon recognized that we need new markets. There's nearly a billion people in 1972. There's nearly a billion people in China. That could possibly mean a billion pair of blue jeans. That could possibly mean a billion uh, telephones, a billion transistor radios. That could be a billion of this or a billion of that. If we could find a way to sell cars in China, there's no telling how much money we could make on that deal. Now, you know and I know that that's not the way it worked out after the Chinese turned the tables on us. That's not, what, that's not the way it looked then. Furthermore, Nixon recognized the need to engage with China. In other words, they had the bomb. They were a regional power, and we had to go out and talk to them. We just had to do that. We can't keep up this Cold War forever and ever and ever. And so I have it up there, and this is like really counterintuitive. A Democrat could never go talk to the Russians. A Democrat could never go talk to the Communist Chinese because many Americans, and this is really the Republicans saying this, America, many Americans felt like they were like halfway to being, you know, socialist and communist already. So Democrats had to stay away from the communists. So ironically, therefore, the only ones that could really go talk to the communists was a, an avowed and stout and strong and proven anti-communist. That's the only ones who could do it. And so, that's Richard Milhouse Nixon. He had a strong anti-communist um, uh, record. He'd said that, you know, his rhetoric was all about that. And so he was, it was safe for him to go talk to them. So he goes and talks to the Chinese, gets on the Air Force One, off they go. Now, the, the photographs there, um, that place where Richard Milhouse Nixon is standing on that photograph on the uh, left, that's where uh, the Chinese take everybody. That's about, I don't know, 40 miles or so north of Beijing. Uh, it's right on the Mongolian border, and that's kind of where everybody gets taken to. There's a big gate there. Uh, you kind of can see those vehicles parked in the parking lot. Uh, they sell t-shirts down there and water and this, that, and the other, and that's where everybody gets to go. So as it turns out, you know, I've actually stood right on that exact spot. Uh, that's where everybody gets to go. Uh, in the middle photograph, he's talking to the premier of China at the time. His, guy, his name is Cho Enlai. You don't have to worry about that. But there he is talking to the Chinese. And he's actually talking on the uh, lower right. He's talking to Mao Zedong. He's actually talking to the chairman of the party, the chairman of the Communist Party, Mao. And so the meeting itself is like really wildly successful. Uh, Nixon comes back from this thing. There's a big celebration. Uh, he's been to Red Square. He's talked to these Chinese. And, you know, he's going to try and get some trade going, get some business going. And everybody in America was very, very convinced that we were going to dominate the Chinese markets. And we're going to, able to, going to be able to start selling some real good stuff over there and start making a lot of money. And that would be a good idea for us. So going into the 1972 election, uh, Nixon has this, you know, kind of going for him. Well, that's not the only thing. So this idea that a strong anti-communist can only speak to the communists, bear that in mind as we go on to the next slide. Now, the next slide, uh, here we are. Again, it's the middle of 1972, and we have a treaty with the Russians. And this is the SALT Treaty. SALT stands for... Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty. SALT stands for Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty. Now this is SALT 1, SALT 2, that will be uh, Jimmy Carter. I think we're on SALT 3 right now. I think that was, um, I'm pretty sure that was uh, um, George W. Bush, George H.W. Bush, Daddy Bush, that's who it was. 
But what does the treaty, uh, what's it all about? Number one, stop building the big bombs. Go talk to the Russians and tell them, listen, we're going to stop building the big bombs. you got to stop building the big bombs. Don't do that anymore, please. Don't sell any bombs to your allies. Don't give them away. Don't sell them. Now, the Russians were not very guilty of that. They kept all their bombs under really strict control. They kept those things under control. They had given the bomb to the Chinese. And then the Chinese and the Russians had a falling out. So Russia was just as afraid of China, as it turns out. A lot of people don't know this. They were just as afraid of China as they were of the United States. So the Russians weren't going to give the bomb away to anybody. But we had been doing that. We made sure the, the British and the French had the bomb. Uh, this is completely unconfirmed, but everybody's like 99% sure that the Israelis have the bomb because we gave it to them. Uh, presumably, if the Germans want the bomb, we'll give them the bomb. They said they didn't want it. The Japanese certainly don't want the bomb, but if they want it, we'll give it to them. But the idea was don't sell or give any bombs. Don't sell any bombs to your allies. Don't give them away. Last, agree on a total number of bombs with the idea being that you'll only go down from there. Agree on a total number of bombs that everybody has on the premise that you're going to go down from there. No, the, 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 the amount of bombs that you have will not climb. Now, this takes a lot of trust, which leads me to really the last thing I have to say here. It's really kind of strange, but Nixon and Brezhnev, Leonid Brezhnev, Leonid Brezhnev, he, that's him that you see there with those big giant eyebrows. He was the leader of the Soviet Union at the time. And uh, Nixon and Brezhnev, they really did hit it off on a personal level. They got along really famously. They had a genuine, true friendship. Uh, they talked to each other as friends. They got along together really, really well. Um, and they, uh, they, they, uh, you could see them like smiling and laughing together. And they really did get along together very, very well. Well, that helped out the negotiations a lot. And quite frankly, the Russians wanted the same thing we did. Uh, Khrushchev had left this like really big uh, fear in Russia of a nuclear war. He'd scared the crap out of the Russians. And so Brezhnev comes along next, and he's like, "Listen, we gotta like we gotta do something about this." So when Nixon reached out to the Russians and said, let's give this thing a try, the Russians were okay with it. Uh, Nixon, as it turns out, whether you like him as a president or not, he hit this one, he, he got this one right. He hit this one out of the ballpark. He did a good job on this one. He gauged what the Russians were up to, listened to what they were saying, he reached out to them in the right way, uh, he, hit out the, he hit the right uh, uh, personality uh, with Leonid Brezhnev, their personalities like clicked. And so we actually got a really, really good treaty. Now, at the top, uh, the upper, what would it be, upper left, you see them like, you know, out there on the balcony waving at the crowd, and they're laughing and giggling together, sharing a little private joke. Uh, at the bottom, you kind of see, uh, this is uh, that's how you spell Nixon by Russian and Brezhnev by Russian. Uh, again, in the upper right, you can see Leonid Brezhnev and Nixon like talking, and they're like working it all out. Everybody's having a great time. But I do want to draw your attention to that uh, the, the lower uh, right, the present nuclear strength. Now, that was in 1972. So the Russians really did reveal, they were really honest about this, and they revealed what they had. And so uh, ICBMs, we had a few. We didn't have that many fewer than they did, but we had a few. They had a few more than we did. Uh, but submarine launch missiles, which are the, actually those are the most dangerous, we had a whole lot more than they did. And long-range bombers, we had a whole lot more than they did. So in terms of nuclear strength, we're like really, really close to one another. And then the Russians were saying, okay, we're willing to like start getting rid of the big bombs. We'll start getting rid of the older bombs. And the Americans said, okay, well, we'll do the same thing. We'll get rid of the older bombs. Now, later on, the catchphrase will be check, trust but verify, trust but verify. And so, uh, later on, when we get to SALT 2 and SALT 3, the idea is to send neutral observers, usually some country like Czechoslovakia or Finland or Sweden, uh, the Swiss get involved in this. Uh, both sides will agree on an investigator, and the investigator will go to the American side, and they'll check everything. And then, 
we'll have investigators that will go to the Russian side and they'll check everything. And the, the idea is, I've actually been involved in these things, that if the investigator shows up, nothing is off limits. They get to open up every door, no matter what it is. If it's got a lock on it and you don't have the key, you got to bust the lock. If they want to see it, you got to open it up. You have, they have to be able to check everywhere. And so uh, the Russians, as it turns out, were actually quite honest about this. And the Americans were actually honest about it as well. And so we began to reduce this danger of blowing each other to pieces with nuclear weapons. Well, that's actually very, that's very popular. So Nixon timed all this right politically back in America. So he could go back to the American people and say, here's all the really great things that I did. Re-elect me. And by the way, Hubert Humphrey is on the other side, and he hasn't done anything, and he's a nobody. So uh, when you think of that Electoral College map, uh, whether you like Nixon or not, that guy, man, uh, his, uh, his, his uh, political acumen is admirable. All right? So that's all I have to say about uh, the 1960s. Uh, I got you through uh, the first part of this with uh, Nixon, I'm sorry, with uh, uh, Kennedy, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, we've taken a look at all that. Uh, now we've taken a look at, uh, you know, what's going on with uh, the very end of the 1960s. Now, again, in between that is civil rights and the Vietnam War. And uh, either I will have a, a presentation on that uh, online sooner or later, or uh, we will do that in class. So thank you very much for your time, and that's, um, that's, that concludes my presentation here.